and welcome to Diverse and Inclusive Leaders, the podcast show where I interview the most inspirational and thought-provoking leaders of today and unearth their unique stories of diversity and inclusion to help inspire, educate and motivate others to make the world a better place. Today, I am delighted to be joined by the fabulous Adrian Kelby. Adrian has had a incredibly diverse and unique career. Um, she is currently chief executive and board member of the Office for Nuclear Registration, or ONR for short, which works to make sure that nuclear facilities are safe and secure across the whole of Great Britain. She's also a trustee of Care Tech Charitable Foundation, which helps careers um, carers, sorry, and their families. Um, she's also a patron for the charity for women in nuclear, which helps the nuclear sector become more diverse. Only 22% of Great Britain nuclear workers are women, which is incredible. Um, Adrienne is, as I'm sure that you'll see, for those who are watching on YouTube or, or listening in um, to this podcast today, is she's described as a breath of fresh air, huge amount of um, very infectious, positive energy with a very playful side, but also a serious one as well. And this seemingly kind of um, amazing ability to be able to drive, coach, mentor people forward. I know that people often wonder how she manages to fit in absolutely everything that she does within the day, which is quite incredible. So, um, so it will be great to learn a lot more about some of these aspects of what she's doing as a transformational leader. I'm very, very interested in developing people and really helping um, them along their development and learning journey. In addition, um, she has broadened beyond where she's at at the moment for the ONR. She has recently been nominated, we actually saw her um, at the Northern Power Women Awards, um, had some fantastic accolades there, um, has been nominated as one of the powerful women um, through the Ambassadorial Network, where she was awarded um, Rare Distinction, an honorary fellow for the Nuclear Institute, um, and also as a very powerful woman ambassador for the north of Britain. So welcome to the show, Adrienne. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here. I feel rather exhausted after all of the amazing accolades that you've won, of which I know there is many, and there's even plenty there that I've not mentioned as well around the kind of Charter Fellow of um, an Institute for Personnel and Development. Um, but it'd be great for everyone just to, to learn a little bit more from you about about yourself personally and how you came to be, I guess, where you are today. <laughs> well, I remember um, I get asked this question a lot because I, I really believe I'm quite an unusual uh, pick for the Office for Nuclear Regulation. This is a really serious uh, health, uh, safety, security job covering nuclear sites across the UK. So the biggest question I get is, you know, are you an engineer? Are you, you know, a mathematician? How did you get here? And I'm, I'm neither. Uh, I have considered myself a generalist who really, really loves people and who's still on quite a learning journey, I have to say, of, of myself, never mind anyone else. But I came here, um, you know, I left school, um, I dropped out of college after a year and, and I went on to be a PA. And since then, I have really paid lots of attention to lots of things, uh, studied hard, worked hard and listened to a lot of people who have helped. So I've been a trainer for many years, which I absolutely love. I still consider that every leader is a trainer, uh, you, know, you know, first and foremost. Uh, I've run safeguarding services for the Home Office, uh, a local authority, a great career um, in grant making with uh, what's now the Big Lottery Community Fund, which was a fantastic opportunity to meet communities across the length and breadth of Britain. So, you know, how did I get here? I applied. And I think that's a big lesson that you cannot get opportunities if you don't put your hand out and actually go for them. And I, I found myself constantly just encouraging people to try things and, and to opt into things, even if there's a fear of rejection. So I love this job. It's, it's amazing. That, I mean, the people I'm, I'm looking around my office, it's so busy here, you can't believe. But this is how I'm at ONR. I love people. And I volunteer for stuff that I'm not sure I can quite do just yet. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I think there's something really to be said about that, um, to really just to put your hand up and volunteer for things without necessarily knowing what the outcome may be, but actually embracing as much as you possibly can, because it's only then that actually you have the opportunity to perhaps open new doors to, to things that, that, that you could be experiencing. Agreed. And I think a lot of the work I do with people, men and women, um, really it's confidence. 
uh, we focus very much on our competence. And that's in incredibly important, especially as you can imagine a nuclear regulator. But I think what we often lack is the confidence to try new things. And I'm very fortunate that in my adult life, um, I worry a lot less about what people say and think about me. It's, it's um, not that I don't care, but you know, I can't live my life being small to avoid upsetting other people by doing the right things. Mm -hmm. So I really think there's a big thing in, in coaching and mentoring people just saying, what's the worst that can happen? Seriously, what is the real worst that can happen? And often when we have that conversation, it's not really that bad a worst. And, and there's much, much more opportunity to be gained. We all fail. You know, Leila, you've failed, I'm sure, albeit not very often. I definitely oh, no, failed at some have failed at many things. You know, and you feel absolutely horrible. You know, you feel rotten about it. But the whole point is you learn from it, you get bigger, you get bolder and you try new things. So I really think in inclusion that this space is about creating the confidence for people to say yes to stuff that they might secretly want to. But at the moment, they say no. That's it's a really interesting point. And I, I do think, I mean, certainly statistics show um, that and not just women and other minorities, I guess, and do sometimes lack the confidence to put their hand up for things because they are in the minority. But, um, you know, really, it, it, it is important, I suppose, we surround ourselves with other people and really try and push ourselves forward to actually, yeah. actually start volunteering. Because if we don't do that, then we're not leaving a path for, for future leaders, whether they be male, female, um, ethnic minorities, LGBTQ+, plus, etc. Yeah, I think everybody has moments of, of confidence crisis. It's a matter of uh, perhaps perspective on, on how people respond to those. Even the strongest of us have bad days and I think it's okay to say I'm not okay today and that's fine. That's not the day to take a risk. Mm -hmm. But it's massively important in all the other days we say let's give it a shot and and, and to really keep that self-talk. You know that thing in the head that says, oh, if you do that, there's going to be big problems and, and I am completely capable, you know, in, in, a, in a weak moment of mapping you know this opportunity to homelessness and failure within about three seconds my brain can do that critical path so fast we all can uh but it's really helpful just to say hang on a minute this is this is not real this is not reality let's just look at how we're perceiving things and it's been amazing i mean some of the things even in this team that people have gone on to do through you know often marginal conversations, not even a, a coaching or a mentoring session, mm -hmm. but a corridor conversation. And, and I think for all of us just to remember how important it is to folks around us that a little bit of time and, you know, sometimes three minutes can change can change how somebody else's day has gone and that can change a life. And it sounds a little bit kind of worthy, frankly, and I don't mean it in that way, but I really didn't understand, I think, the power um, of creating confidence in other people until I became a trainer, and now it has to be part of the part of the part of the job, and, and part of me. Never mind the job. Absolutely, and I know that you're a big fan of trying to change attitudes in a positive way. Obviously, this is a lot of what you do around your coaching and your your development side. How have you seen people develop o over the course? And is there any kind of advice that you might be able to give if there's anyone who's out there having a bit of a hard time or or really struggling with with having that positive attitude to actually make things happen? Yeah, I think there's two kinds of attitudinal thing I would uh, I would reflect. One is the resilience, and it's really what I've just been mm -hmm. touching on there. We all have bad days, and sometimes we imagine other people don't have bad days, and that makes us feel even worse. It's not the case. I think resilience is about understanding that we all have bad bad moments, bad days, bad periods. You come out stronger, and not to let those get you down. And if it's not something that you find easy, a, a network is absolutely essential. Not just a network that says, "Oh, that's that's a shame," but a network that really helps you work through. So, I think resilience um, is incredibly important in leadership, but it's important that we create that in our teams. Um, and there are lots of small things you can do, like just you know, as I've said, what's the worst that can happen, and to help people logic things out when they when they feel down. Um, I think the the second kind really is just having what I would term a bad attitude, and uh, I have this belief that the only disability in life is a bad attitude. Um, and I know this myself because as a child, I used to give up on things. I didn't like being bad at things. I didn't like joining classes. I moved school several times. So I had to, you know, jump into new groups. And and at times I was the one with the bad attitude. I didn't want to push it through. I didn't want to be there. So I opted out of things instead of getting on with them. And that really changed when I met horses uh, and I became, um, you know, a fairly decent rider. So I've learned that lesson. Actually, it was me that was putting myself. It wasn't the other people. 
nobody else has power over me. Only I have power over me unless I choose to give it to someone. And so when it comes to that bad attitude, I think, you know, it's easy to back off people that you perceive to, to be difficult, uh, perhaps, or, or to avoid conversations with people who you're afraid of what will come back, rejection, failure, um, you know, bad things. But again, if you do not have those conversations, you don't have the courage to go and deal with a bad attitude, then it will definitely not get better on its own. And the belief that I was brought up with is if you leave things, they generally get worse. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's tempting. You might leave it a day or two, but don't leave it months. Um, and a lot of what I see when I when I meet new people, maybe the things that are holding them back are actually five or ten years ago or three or four years ago. It's things that happened to them that really they're holding so, so much in, in their current psyche and it's holding them back. And this person who was mean or, or difficult or, or awful many years ago is still holding power over them. Well, frankly, that's not all. And I'm not doing that with anybody and I don't want my team to do it either. So mm -hmm. that courageous conversation and tackle anybody else with a bad attitude and make sure that you have a great one. What's not to love? Absolutely. It's amazing though, and it's so true that people do, it's amazing how people hold on to these negative connotations of things that have happened in the past and they hold it with them. And the only way to really let go is by either, you know, getting over that fear of failure or addressing that issue or speaking to someone about it. You know, those peer-to-peer -peer conversations, yeah. like you say, are so incredibly important to actually allow people yeah. to be able to move forward. Definitely. Um, and, you know, at FIRA does come great things. Um, I, I really, really wanted to, to show jump. And my mum and dad were kind enough to get me this lone pony when I was, oh gosh, I think I was eight. Um, and I've been whinging about this since the age of five when they put me in a donkey in Spain. That was my dream was to, to have my own pony. Uh, just to be clear, they weren't rich. This cost everything we had. And um, I, I finally got to my first ever show. Uh, this, this course was called Sulit Electric. That was her show name. She was a, a little grey roan thing. She was quite flighty, quite skinny, and, and I was giddy. I mean, literally giddy with excitement. Uh, and I, and I over prepared, and I got there hours early. And it was cold. It was Scotland. It's generally cold. Uh, and, you know, and I got there, and I went into the ring. Um, and I think I was so full of nervous energy that uh, we, we rode up to the first fence, and she she stopped at it. She, refusal, which is three points, and she'll jump in. Um, my God, you know, and I could feel my heart pounding in my chest and that kind of looking at the gallery, seeing everybody looking at me, just beginning to burn with embarrassment. So, you know, I pulled myself up, I went back, she refused again. Now, I'm not surprised. Who wants to go over a fence with the rider that's themselves absolutely petrified of what's coming? And then it happened again at the first fence. Three refusals, that means you're chucked out of the competition. Um, and I just, I wanted to just, <laughs> I wanted to give up. Uh, and my dad kind of said to me, Adrienne, if you honestly think you're going to get through life without failing, then you're having a laugh. Get back on that horse. Literally get back on that horse. I know that's Literally. the same, but that's what he said. Literally get back on that horse and sort yourself out. It, it wasn't on the sympathetic side. My mother, of course, gave me a cuddle and told me she still loved me. It would be fine. But, you know, that's at the age of kind of eight, nine, where I had a bit of history of, of kind of leaving things. And, and now you know, I actually feel my heart racing just thinking about that, no, you know, remembering what it felt like. It's dark riding school and just this abject shame of being chucked out of my first ever competition. Um, do you know what? That could, have, that could really have held me back. In the same way people come and they say, I didn't get that job. That manager didn't give me the project I wanted. I tried this and it went horribly wrong. I did my first public speech. It was horrible. It'll all be okay. You just have to go and try it again and get help to do even better next time. And how soon was it that you got back on that horse? I, I was back on that horse the next day. I had a good cry to myself, I'll be honest. Um, uh, but mainly, I'll be honest, it was more because I was so I didn't want to let my dad down because <laughs> I knew how much they'd put in to get me this lone pony. Uh, so I went back on. Um, it was a few years later. Uh, the, the lone pony went back a few months uh, later. I never won anything on her. And then they got me a little ex riding school pony that was uh, going and cheap in a, in a, in a sale of a, a riding school that was closing down. Uh, and I remember my first was it was a yellow one, which is third. That, that took me some months. Um, and I don't remember all the other stuff in the middle. Uh, you know, there are a lot of highs and lows, but you know, I know that was at Scottish Championship level, and I know that I loved so we had a room full of rosettes and cups, and and those meant a lot to me. But but the thing that has meant the most to me is understanding I am my own master. It is up to me. Nobody else comes and feeds your horse. Nobody else sorts out the schedules, which seems a bit tangential to running a nuclear regulator. But it really comes down, I think, to accountability and attitude. You have to take accountability for yourself. You, you can't 
blame others, at least not in the long term. And, and understanding that we can get through anything if we have friends and colleagues that want mm -hmm. to help us, that give us that confidence to get back on the metaphorical horse these days. Mm -hmm. That's such a lovely story. Thank you so much for sharing that. I really appreciate that. And I think it's applicable as well. You know, I know we obviously we've touched on um, the nuclear industry and, and everyone who's tuning in at the moment, probably from yeah. lots and lots of different industries. But I think, you know, it's great st sharing stories like that because they're things that people can relate to. You know, when you were telling yeah. that story, it was making me think, oh, goodness, you know, there was a childhood memory I had where I stood up in front of all of these people at school and burst into yeah. tears, having to give a speech, yeah. and from then on was scared of giving public speeches. Like you say, it is, it's a mindset yeah. piece. It's all in your mind. You make it worse. You are the master yeah. of your own mind. And so until you are the one who changes it, isn't going to be anyone else who's going to do it for you. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So... Moving on to, to other subjects, I know that you're an absolute advocate of diversity and inclusion. I think it's great that you're flying the yeah. flag out there for, for women in, in, the, uh, in the nuclear industry specifically, because the, the figures are, are, are relatively low, but obviously getting better. Yeah. Talk to me about diversity and inclusion and what that really means for you, and you know, perhaps how how you're changing things internally because I can see that you're and obviously you're winning these awards you're you're at the helm of, of steering these great initiatives I think it's a great example for for other businesses to be able to learn from when they are going through their own diversity and inclusion journeys for me it's everything and and, and I, I believe when I'm flying the flag as you put it of diversity and inclusion I'm flying it for everybody not just for women because diverse workforces are better for everybody uh, and I, I think that's a message that sometimes is lost in translation. I, I get a little bit of flack sometimes, you know, why are you spending time on, on women in nuclear? Why do you talk about this in, in every, uh, you know, presentation that you make on behalf of ONR or elsewhere? And it's because I fundamentally believe I want the best workforce I can have. Look at the stakes of a nuclear regulator getting things wrong. And look at the opportunities when we get them right for our teams. So I think it's very important that where we are aware organizationally of a bias in the mindset that you do everything that you possibly can to, to diversify that. So it's as much for me about the, an, the analytical side of this organization, having the best possible different kinds of mindsets and information coming in to help us do our work as it is about just being a great place to work um, you know I previously worked in the fundraising sector where it was completely opposite it was 22 percent men and everybody else women and that was a bit women heavy so I really think that this is about having great places to work um, where, where everybody's welcome uh, I think the appointment of me as chief exec, to, to be really honest, heralded a bit of a change, uh, you know, very much um, credit Nick Baldwin, our previous chair, with the courage to appoint somebody who wasn't a kind of engineer, scientist, um, or indeed regulator. And to understand that we already have a lot of people who are great at that. What we needed was more kind of organizational development, people development, and just a different thought, maybe more modern uh, viewpoint on, on organizations. So the things that we've done in ONR have actually been on, on one level very simple. We've made our role models visible. And when I look back at photos that ONR used to publish in, in the reports, you know, you wouldn't see anybody that you could identify with as a young female in particular, even a young man. So, you know, in having images, in having uh, really strong uh, voices saying, this is how we rock, this is what we do and, and how we work, that's made a big difference to other people thinking maybe I would be welcome there. Oh, I might just phone up about that job. And I know that I've had people join here who have said, you know, I saw myself or someone else speak from ONR and they would never in a month of Sundays thought about coming and joining us. But just seen as a human being, speaking plainly, being very friendly, and this is one of the friendliest places you can work, actually gave them that confidence to get in touch and say, I'd really like to work with this top-notch regulator and to come join us. But we've also done more practical things. We realized that a lot of our recruitment literature was a little bit insular in the way it presented the organization. Our wording, our language was a little bit old-fashioned and, and perhaps um, narrow in, in what it valued. So just changing things to be plainer, more open, simpler, friendlier, that reflects the way we are, but wasn't really on the page. And we have changed some of our recruitment practices uh, it's not all about that, I have to say, but just the way that we advertise and, and where we look for people. We use social feed, uh, social media far more, which has really helped bring in a kind of younger demographic and, and younger people to the organization, but not just. Um, and we've used uh, you know, much less agencies, much more direct approach. 
uh, well over, I think it was 75% the last staff survey of people uh, who work here would, you know, talk to somebody else about coming and joining ONR. Many of the people who work here have been brought here by somebody already in it. So, of course, if you're not diverse, the problem is that you keep inculcating a fairly small um, area of potential recruitment. Whereas when you have more diverse people, there's more of us talking to more wider networks, getting different uh, opinions and different people coming in. So for us, it's been a massive change. Um, and I think in the nuclear sector, there's a bit of encouragement and there's a bit of holding to account. Um, We've crept up from 17 to about 22% over the last 10 years uh, as, as women in the nuclear sector. Uh, everybody that I meet at the top tables, every senior government official, talks about the fact that this is an important area. And I'm delighted they've anchored a target uh, for women into the nuclear sector deal. Mm -hmm. But nothing is changing. So we have to hold people to account. It can't all be words and rhetoric. They actually need to do something. Mm -hmm. And my mantra of just do something sometimes is better than everybody getting very worried if they offend or I think there's some fear around this. Just do something is my, my main message to people who are not too sure what to do. Start somewhere. This is what I love about you, Adrian, is that you are so fearless um, when it comes to being very direct about saying the things that need to be said. Because that's the interesting thing around diversity and inclusion. Everyone knows now that we should be doing it and that it is a good thing. But the scales aren't tipping fast enough. And so I yeah. speak to a lot of people and they'll say, you know, I don't believe in metrics and I don't believe in this, that and the other. And I understand that putting quotas against these initiatives to improve diversity is not necessarily, is not as palatable for people as they might like. But frankly, if nothing is happening and nothing is changing, then these targets do need to be put in place so that we can foster this truer, deeper sense of equality and belonging for all. And I think the, yeah. the point that you mentioned there about advertisements and almost, I think you mentioned almost the wallpaper of, of what the business looks like to be able to attract people in. Actually, yeah. it really does make a huge difference that being able yeah. to see someone that looks like you or sounds like you or that, can, or that you can relate to, especially for the younger generations of leaders that are coming through. Because, and I hope you don't mind me saying this, you know, the nuclear industry, you don't, you think of it in a way as quite an old school industry. You know, I think yeah. the fact that you are really changing minds and perceptions over this is, is, is really yeah. quite wonderful. And again, yeah. I, I mean, we, we do get that old school point. Um, and, you know, we have a lot of so-called old school, whatever that is, you know, real sage, long, long experience uh, people in our teams. And are we really clear? We absolutely depend on them. But of course, they retire lucky sods. <laughs> so, you know, when I came in 2016, you know, that we, we'd, we'd lost a lot of people who were very experienced and because they, they were able to retire and I, and I wish them all the best and some come back and help us a little bit. But, you know, we really needed to attract new people. This was not some kind of philo philosophical Adrian Kelby view of the world. Mm -hmm. This was hard cold business needs mm -hmm. and to be bringing in now not only graduates but apprentices through the organization mm -hmm. you know what's given us a new list to life and we have a right mm -hmm. good giggle at things and they're helping me with my social media so there's, and there's a real uh, lots of wins with it um, and an issue of targets I really I really have mixed feelings about it mm -hmm. I think for government to anchor a target into the deal shows the concern at the lack of progress. Um, and that's not all about employers. I have to say this is also about women stepping up and taking jobs and staying in STEM uh, subjects and knowing that there's a place for them. So there's a lot of work to be done in schools and colleges. And, and I believe that careers advisors and tutors and coaches can all play a big role in helping girls know that it's a great uh, sector to be in. I wish I'd had more of that um, when I was at school. So, you know, the notion about targets for me is an indication of failure. It is an indication that other things are not working. ONR has not set targets. And we have made dramatic difference because I believe the drive and the vision is there from my team. When there is the alleged drive and vision with no results, then I think you do have to go to different kind of metrics and measures to give it some focus so that everybody sees it as important. The old mantra, what gets measured gets done. I don't believe that all the way, but I think in this case, we're probably there. Absolutely. It's kind of, it's that top down, but also bottoms up approach. There's not a magic wand to just fix the problem of, of lacking diversity and inclusion. 
across the board. It needs to be this multifaceted approach where everyone is along the ride and along for the journey and looking at things from lots of different angles, like you say. And it's really great to see that you've moved up from 17 to 22% without targets because everyone is bought into the idea and no that's it I think a lot of the time it is it is winning hearts and minds to inspire the purpose and action and if that purpose and action um, doesn't translate into tangible figures at that point um, you know it, it, it is a requirement to, to do something more drastic whether that be putting in quotas or, or saying right yeah. you need to be meeting these metrics. Indeed and let me just because I think we've just about got time. I've just realized that actually we've been speaking for a whole half an hour already. Uh, I could continue. Oh, really? Yes, I could, conti- I could continue talking for, um, I mean, there's actually another, a, a number of other questions that I wanted to ask you about that. But maybe we'll organize another podcast on another day and we'll, we'll dig deeper into other <laughs> subjects. Um, but Adrian well, Mark too, yeah, the return. <laughs> the return of dot, dot, dot. Um, so let's just whip into a lightning round for the end and I'm going to give you 30 seconds. 30 seconds, okay, only, go on, Adrian, to answer each one right. of these questions because I'd really love, and I'm sure that people who are listening in are thinking, oh, but how? And how can I get to this position? And perhaps um, there's okay. you know, other pieces of advice that I might be able to learn. So let's go into to a, a very quick lightning round. You've got 30 seconds to answer each one of these questions. Okay. And then what we'll do is I think we'll summarize some of the learning pieces for everyone who's at home or in the office listening in today. So, okay. Adrienne, what, what, what would you say is your secret to success? Being my best me, not trying to be somebody else. I tried that in my 20s. It didn't work out well. Being my best me, owning my own, you know, issues, um, and saying yes to stuff that I initially want to say no to. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, great. And what about advice that you might give to your younger self? The show jumping Oh, that honestly that is that is so easy for me stop worrying what everybody else is thinking or or, or saying or even not thinking or saying just do what's right and if you do your best then you know other people don't have power I, I, I like that courage I think as a child um in some areas not in everything so just yeah don't worry too much you're always going to get people who who'll say things about you and half the time they don't mean it so especially in these days of social media do not pay attention to your detractors do the right thing and it is really easy to pay attention to what's happening on social media on that note very quickly to think wow everyone's doing amazing stuff I'm not you start to compare yourself you feel like you have to benchmark yourself against those people yeah it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a real thing. Highlights not are not real. And there's two things. Uh, uh, we've got a really good coach working in the organization and he's got this great saying that, um, you know, we are Teflon for praise and Velcro uh, for criticism. So we hang on to all the negative things that people say, but we almost edit out all the things, the positive things that they say. So that's really stuck with me because I'm, I'm trying to work on that a bit more myself. That's a great saying. And who has inspired you most throughout your career or life indeed? I mean, my mum and dad have been amazing. Uh, I lost my dad about 18 months ago, but I still feel like he's here because he's so much a part of of how I think about things. So that's quite soft and soppy, but it definitely is. They are really just great, good, kind people. Uh, I think in my career, two folk have really uh, made a a difference for me. Um, My primary school teacher, uh, way back, Mrs. Page, primary three, where she allowed me to sing in front of the class. <laughs> Interestingly enough, I was a big fan of ABBA at the time. And it was the only thing I really did that was very extroverted. I was much more um, introvert then. So that was a, a thing for me because I stood up in front of folk. I was not quite public speaking. But she was just always very kind and lovely and encouraging, um, even though I wasn't not the best singer, I have to say. And I think somebody who um, inspired me as much through what I learned from him uh, is Simon Lancaster. Uh, Simon Lancaster is a, a speech writer, he's a, he's a lovely London geezer, um, and he worked with me 10 years ago with a team uh, where we were doing a lot of changes. And he just, um, in one day, he really changed the way I perceived language and the power of language. Um, and I've, I've found that that's been really helpful to me. We stay in touch. Uh, he's helped a couple of teams since. But, um, you know, he writes very much about metaphor and um, uh, the importance of language and helping people feel good or knocking them down 
which is not what I'm about. You can see some politicians using rhetoric and metaphor pretty badly. But that changed my life. And, and he's just such good fun to be around. He's got this huge, you know, head full of very important, you know, he writes books and yet we catch up and it's like yesterday. So Simon Lancaster was a big influence for me and, and I credit him with a lot of what I've achieved since. And finally, what's authentic leadership to you? Be yourself. I mean, there's, there's nothing else you can do. Um, we can be better, to be clear. I don't mean this is where we get to say, well, it's just me. And, you know, I'm rubbish at that or I create this carnage wake behind me wherever I go. Tough, it's just me. That's an excuse. That's not authentic, that's not authentic leadership. That's abdication. But authentic leadership is saying, do you know, I know I'm a bit quirky or I know I'm a bit like this. In my case... I have a weird Scottish accent. I talk a lot with my hands. My head bobs around a lot in these things. As you can see, I'm very active uh, and I'm okay with that. I need to create moments where I'm still, clearly. I need to create thinking moments, but I'm okay with that. It doesn't mean I try and turn into somebody who's very, um, you know, different in style. And, and I go back to the point I made earlier about diversity and inclusion. I want to feel included wherever I work. I want to feel that people like me for me, that they welcome what I do because of what I bring to the team. I don't want them making me feel that I have to be more like them to fit in. I want us to collectively make the place better so that everybody fits in. And I think that's what authentic leadership is, creating a space for everybody to be their best, biggest, boldest selves. What a lovely note to to end this podcast on. I think that's a really nice way to come to a conclusion I think certainly I've learned a huge amount from the podcast today and I hope that all of our listeners who are tuning in or watching YouTube have and um, just in quick summary I've been, been scribbling over my, my notebook here I think if there is anyone who, who's who's tuning in that's perhaps having um, a negative uh, something negative happening within their life um, you know really do remember as as Adrian said you are master of your mind. And so really do your best to change that mindset. Try and find some people around you that you can collaborate with, that you can speak with, that you can mm. talk things through. Don't hold that monkey on your shoulder because it's only going to drag you down whatever you're doing in business or in life. Actually, you want to get rid of that monkey, get back onto the, the horse if you can and, and try and embrace those fears because it is the only way forward. I think yeah. another couple of really great learning pieces that I would love companies or individuals to take away from what you've done, Adrienne, is, is the work around e- equality and, and really shining a light on individuals within the organization that you've done at, at the ONR, because I think that is genuinely the way forward to a more equal world. We need to be championing, we need to be inspiring, we need to be talking out about what we're doing, we need to try and change perceptions. Who would have thought it um, that a a nuclear, I mean this in the nicest possible way, I've just realised maybe that's come out a bit bad, but but a nuclear business, that a nuclear business could be such a fun, quirky, cool place to work. STEM is a fascinating arena. So whether you're a guy, whether you're a girl, you know, whichever whichever part of the country you might be from, you know, pick up the phone, give a call, get in touch with Adrian, get in touch with one of the team because hopefully this has changed your perception on the nuclear industry and be incredibly forward thinking. And certainly, you know, with moving the dial already in such a short space of time, frankly, from 17 to 20%, you know, with females alone, I think that is, that is fantastic. It it, it really is, you know, it's keep on pushing on to go in the right direction. And again, disclaimer here, if people are listening thinking, well, you know, that's just for women. It absolutely is not. It's about creating and fostering a more inclusive world where every single person can feel included and feel a part of. So if it was an organization where there are, you know, a lot more women to men or you know, there's, there's other big splits in terms of other aspects of diversity, LGBTQ plus or, or ethnic minorities, BAME, etc. cetera, then, then the same applies. So, so great. Keep up the great work. Hope that, hope that we've inspired some people who are listening. And, and obviously I would love anyone to be able to reach out to Adrienne. Yeah. You can get hold of her on LinkedIn, or I will put the contact details actually onto the show notes for the end of today's show. 
LinkedIn is the best place to get me. It gets me wherever I travel. I'm fortunate we get lots of good messages and just random questions. Seriously, don't think too long about it. If it's something you think I can help with, drop a line and either myself or one of the win team or if it's ONR, ONR will get in touch. But I genuinely wish everybody really well. I hope it's been fun listening in and I'm looking forward to more podcasts, Leila. Thank you for having me. Good stuff. Thank you so much for being with us today, Adrian. My name is Leila McKenzie and you have been listening to Diverse and Inclusive Leaders, the podcast show with you every week. Please Please do subscribe. It's free. You can go on to Apple, you can go on to Spotify or any of your favorite podcast apps. We're also on YouTube as well under Dial Global, which stands for Diverse Inclusive Aspirational Leaders Global, where we've got some really fabulous interviews and fireside chats and podcasts with other inspirational leaders like Adrienne. Mm. So for now, I will wish you goodbye and I'll look forward to seeing you all next week. Thanks again. Thank you so much for watching the Diverse and Inclusive Leaders podcast. Please do feel free to hit the like button below, or if you'd like to receive future notifications, do ping the notification bell here at the side. If you're interested in the audio version only, you can find it on the following streaming platforms. Any extra info and descriptions will be in the links below. Look forward to seeing you soon.